research group is making precise measurements of the flow of water in the stream and the level of water in the ground while it is being pumped from the ground. At a we are conducting this investigation to answer a number of important questions about our water resources. Water is plentiful in Wisconsin at the present time. However, it is being more and more widely used in the home, in the factory, and on the farm. Demand by hunters, fishermen, and boaters for recreational use is also increasing rapidly. As the population increases and their standard of living improves, water requirements will expand greatly and the supply of pure water will become more and more critical. Thus, it is essential that we learn to manage our water resources so that supplies of pure water will be available to support the activities of future generations. The information needed for effective water management is gathered and interpreted by geologists and engineers who specialize in the study of the occurrence and movement of water from the atmosphere, in lakes and streams, and in the ground. They do research to find out how much water is available, how it is being used, and what will happen to the supply under different patterns of usage. Some of their research methods are demonstrated in a study done in the state of Wisconsin. The project was located in an area of sand plains, which extends across the central part of the state. From the air, large sand patches can often be seen. The surface of the land is quite flat. And the native vegetation consists of scrub oak and jack pine. The area is traversed by many small streams with cool waters and steady flows. For many years, the land was considered of value only for hunting and fishing and for pulp wood. But it was found that with supplemental irrigation, high quality potatoes and other vegetables could be produced on the land. Therefore, the use of water for irrigation was expected to increase in the sand plains. And it became important to study both the availability of water and the relationship of groundwater to surface water. The information obtained will help us predict the effects of pumping for irrigation on stream flows and groundwater levels. The first step in the investigation was to find a drainage basin large enough to be representative of the general conditions prevailing in the area, but small enough to lend itself to intensive studies. The drainage basin of the Little Plover River near Stevens Point in Portage County met these conditions. This basin has a surface water drainage area of about 15 square miles and a groundwater drainage area of about 12 square miles. The stream is about three and a half miles long. A study of the geology showed that deposits of glacial outwash cover most of the basin, but moraines in the form of ridges running north and south occur in the headwaters area. A cross-sectional view looking at the subsurface reveals the nature of the rocks that make up the groundwater reservoir. The glacial outwash is composed of sand and gravel deposited by streams from melting glaciers. The arnet and outer moraines are composed of sand, gravel, and large boulders which were lodged in the ice of the glacier and dumped when the ice melted. The outer moraine is a major surface water and groundwater divide with water moving east from the divide toward Lake Michigan and west from the divide to the Wisconsin River. The thickness of the water bearing sand and gravel ranges from less than 30 feet near the Wisconsin River to about 90 feet under most of the Little Plover River Valley. The floor of the groundwater reservoir is underlain by granite which yields virtually no water to wells. At the same time the geologic investigations were being carried out, eight rain gauges were installed in different parts of the area to measure precipitation, as this is the source of all the water entering the basin. 
The water coming into the area as precipitation is discharged from the basin in several ways. Some runs off overground to the stream. Some infiltrates to the water table to become groundwater, which moves to the stream or out of the basin underground. And some is returned to the atmosphere by evaporation and by transpiration through plants. The stream flow is measured by partial flumes. These indicate the amount of stream flow by the depth of water in the flume. This depth is recorded continuously on a chart. Three of these stream gauges were installed to record the amount of stream flow and the groundwater entering the stream from different parts of the basin, and also the total amount of water leaving the basin. Stream flow may also be measured from a record of stream level or stage in the natural stream channel. In this case, it is necessary to rate stream flow versus stage in the channel at the gauging site. Spot measurements of discharge are made for several different stream stages. These measurements are made with a current meter, which is used to measure the velocity of the water. In his earphones, the operator hears the clicks made by the revolving meter wheel. The rate of the clicking tells him the stream velocity. These measurements are made at regular intervals across the channel. Stream flow is calculated by multiplying the cross-sectional area of the flow in the channel by the average stream velocity. The amount of stream flow leaving the basin can be measured directly but the amount of groundwater moving by underflow from the basin is much more difficult to determine. The rate and direction of groundwater movement depends on the shape and slope of the water table and on the thickness and permeability of water-bearing materials. In order to determine these factors, about 40 observation wells were installed and depth to water was measured in these and in 20 other wells in the area. The information on the depth to water in the wells was used to plot contour lines connecting points where the levels of water in the ground are equal. Groundwater moves continuously from points where the water table is high to points where it is low. It flows approximately at right angles to the contour lines. Note that water moves both toward the Little Plover River from either side and westward from the outer moraine to the Wisconsin River. This flow of groundwater to streams continues during periods between rains, thus sustaining the stream flow. The map also shows the boundary of the groundwater basin for the portion of the Little Plover River above the lower stream gauge. The groundwater basin represents the area from which groundwater drains to the stream. It does not coincide with the surface water basin, which is the area over which water will move over ground to the stream. The water table contour map shows the position of the water surface in the fall, but the level of water in the ground changes during the year. The level goes up or down depending on how much water infiltrates to the groundwater reservoir. This graph compares water level changes with the amount of precipitation during the period from summer 1960 to spring 1961. During the summer and fall, groundwater levels declined the midsummer rise in precipitation had no effect on this decline. Most of the rain that fell went to replace soil moisture which had been evaporated or had been transpired by plants. Little of the precipitation reached the water table. At the same time, groundwater was being discharged to the stream more quickly than it was being replenished, so groundwater levels went down. During the winter, the precipitation increased while groundwater levels continued to go down. Most of the precipitation was stored on top of the ground in the form of snow. In the spring, the water levels in the ground rose sharply, although precipitation decreased. A marked rise in water level resulted when the snow melted and infiltrated to the water table. Later in the spring, the curves again reversed their direction. In general, the relationship between water level and precipitation is not constant. 
Sometimes one goes up while the other goes down. At other times, they change together. The relationship depends upon seasonal conditions and weather variations from year to year. The general characteristics of the groundwater reservoir under natural conditions have now been determined, and the amount of water entering the basin from precipitation and the amount flowing out in the stream have been measured. The changes in groundwater storage and the directions of groundwater movement have also been determined. This basic background information then makes it possible to understand what happens when the balance is upset by the artificial withdrawal of water through well pumping. This process was the subject of the next part of the investigation. For this study, a test site near the Little Plover River was selected, and about 300 feet from the stream, a test well was located. In order to measure the effect of pumping on stream flow, the well was purposely drilled close to the stream. Twenty-two small diameter observation wells are installed around the pumping well so that changes in the water levels can be observed as pumping progresses. The observation wells are arranged in a pattern around the test well and extend across the stream. Four stream gauges are installed in the test area to detect effects that pumping may have on stream flow. The well is equipped to pump about 1,000 gallons per minute. Irrigation pipe is attached to the pump to lead the water away from the test site. About 2,500 feet of irrigation pipe is used. extends from the pump to the stream far below the test site to prevent any water from entering the ground and recirculating back to the water table. At the end of the pipe, equipment is installed to measure accurately the amount of water to be discharged. The scene is now set for the aquifer test to be started. The test well tapped the sand and gravel down to the granite base 90 feet below the land surface. The observation wells extended down beneath the water table to a depth of about 10 feet. By analyzing the decline or drawdown in the pumping well and observation wells, two questions can be answered about the water bearing sand and gravel. How much water can it store? And how quickly does water pass through it? A pre-test series of measurements confirms that the water table and stream flow are stable. The measurements are complete and the crew is standing by. This is Wednesday, the 25th of October, 1.15 p.m. And we are starting. Immediately, we begin taking measurements of the changing depths to water in the pumping well and the 22 surrounding observation wells. The leaks in the pipe are quickly remedied to prevent recharge that could affect groundwater levels. It took about five minutes for the water to travel the 20 air is bled from the manometer line so the water pressure indicator will be accurate. Knowing the exact diameter of the orifice and the discharging pressure, it is found that the rate of flow is 800 gallons per minute. This information is relayed back to the pump operator who then increases the engine speed. Now it is pumping too much, but further adjustments will soon stabilize the rate of flow at 1120 gallons per minute.
The plan is for the pump to continue operating for 74 hours. Measurements of change in water levels and stream flow will be made during this period and for about 74 hours after pumping stops. There is a cold wind blowing and a light drizzle falling, less than five hundredths of an inch. The rain is not enough to interfere with the test, but our notes do get wet. At the start of the test, while water levels are dropping fast, each man has from three to six wells to measure, and each well is measured about once every 10 minutes. At each measurement station, we record the precise depth to water in the well and the time of the observation. As soon as the data is collected, it is sent to the temporary field office where it is plotted up for analysis by an engineer from Egypt who is learning some of our methods. The pattern of changing water levels soon gives us a picture of what is happening below ground. During the first few minutes of the test, all the water pumped by the well is being derived from groundwater storage, and the cone of depression spreads rapidly. As soon as the cone reaches the stream, some of the stream flow is diverted toward the well, and the shape of the cone is altered. The cone declines more slowly across the stream from the well than it does between the well and the stream, because the stream is supplying part of the water pumped. Little water is moving toward the well from that part of the aquifer on the other side of the stream. In plan view, the cone is shown spreading rapidly in all directions until it reaches the stream. At this point, the cone begins to spread along the stream as water is diverted to the well from points further upstream and downstream. The measurements taken in the stream show the effects of the pumping on stream levels. These effects are summarized in this graph which compares the rate of pumping with the rate of decline in stream flow. After the pump had been on about 10 minutes, the stream stage began to drop rapidly, showing that water from the stream is being diverted to the well. Note that the diversion continues to increase throughout the test, but at a slower and slower rate. By the end of the test, about one-third of the water being pumped will be coming through the ground from the stream. The research team continues to make measurements. Three days and four nights the work goes on. Each man works a six-hour shift. Six hours out in the field, six hours off. But not all of that is rest. New data has to be plotted up as it comes in. During the latter part of the test, measurements are made less frequently because the water levels are dropping more slowly. However, the men must get the equipment ready to measure the first part of the water level recovery once the pump is shut off. Now we are gathered for the start of the recovery phase. Watches must again be synchronized so that measurements will be time is drawing near when the pump will be stopped. Even though the pump is stopped, water continues to flow through the 2,500 feet of pipe. The flow continues for about 15 minutes. Once the pump is shut off, the recovery of water levels in the wells and in the stream is measured to check the drawdown data. The recovery data is not affected by fluctuations in the pumping rate and is more uniform than the drawdown data. While the water levels are coming up rapidly, all members of the research team take as many measurements as possible. The water level 
walls recover at about the same rate as they were drawn down, and the cone of depression resulting from the pumping is almost completely filled three days after the pump has been shut off. The recovery of the stream level is also observed to see how quickly stream flow recovers from the effects of groundwater pumping. The normal level of stream flow was also quickly restored after the pump was stopped. The first phase of the test, pumping from the groundwater source, has now been completed and the irrigation pipe is being moved into a new location for the second phase, pumping from the river. During the river pumping test, the water cannot be released downstream. Therefore, about 5,000 feet of irrigation pipe is used to carry the water out of the basin. Eleven additional observation wells are installed near the stream to measure the effects of lowering the stream level on nearby groundwater levels. Five new gauging stations are installed downstream from the pumping site to measure the amount of groundwater being picked up along different parts of the stream. A small flume is also placed on a spring which feeds the Little Plover River to determine its contribution to stream flow. The pump has been installed about 300 feet upstream from the groundwater pumping site and now nearly everything is prepared for the test. The pipeline is completed by laying a section across a country road. At the end of the pipeline, the instruments have been tested. The men are standing by, ready to start their measurements. Discharge is measured with a calibrated orifice, as in the previous test. The height of the water in the column indicates that the stream is being pumped at a rate of about 1,200 gallons per minute. Problems usually arise during pumping tests, and this test is no exception. Floating leaves threaten to clog the pump, so a net is installed above the pump intake. A biologist studies the stream to see if the pumping is having any effect on fish or other aquatic life. Meanwhile, the pump intake must be kept open. Water was pumped from the stream for 30 hours during this test, and measurements of changes in stream flow were made continuously at the nine flumes. 
The decline in stream levels near the pump was rapid and dramatic, but the effects further downstream were no less apparent. At the beginning of the test, about 1,500 gallons of water per minute was flowing in the stream at the pump. As soon as the pump was turned on, the stream flow immediately below the pump was reduced in a few minutes to about 500 gallons per minute. The stream then continued to flow at this rate for the rest of the test. One mile below the pump, the initial rate of stream flow continued for about two hours. During this period, water that was stored within the stream channel between the stream gauges was removed. After two hours had elapsed, the stream flow at the lower gauge began to decline rapidly. The stream then declined for three hours until it nearly stabilized at a rate of about 200 gallons per minute more than the rate of flow near the pump. The downstream flow is larger because some water enters the stream from storage within the ground. Groundwater levels were observed in the wells next to the stream throughout the test. In cross-section, we see that in the beginning of the test, the stream level dropped very quickly, but the groundwater levels dropped slowly, indicating that the groundwater is being released slowly to the stream. As time passes, however, the difference between the groundwater level and the stream water level diminishes indicating that the groundwater contribution to the stream again becomes constant as time goes on. Once the pump is shut off, the gradient between the stream and the groundwater is reduced, and the stream does not fully recover to its initial flow until the groundwater removed from storage during pumping is replenished. Let's review the information obtained. From the rainfall records, we know how much water is being contributed annually to the basin. From the stream flow records, we know how much water is leaving the basin. The geologic studies have defined the nature and thickness of the water-bearing materials, and the pumping test has shown their permeability and the amount of water they can store. The quantity of water that is released from storage as water levels change can now be determined and from our information on the thickness of the aquifer materials, their permeability, and the slope of the water table, we can calculate the amount of water moving out of the basin underground. Now, by subtracting stream flow, groundwater underflow, and the changes in groundwater storage from precipitation, we may determine how much water is being evaporated or transpired by plants. The information from the pumping test also enables us to calculate the effects that pumping wells have on each other, and thus predict the distance that wells should be spaced in order to prevent undue interference of one well with another. We can now also predict what effect groundwater withdrawals from wells at different locations will have on stream flow. Thus, we now know the hydrologic system under natural conditions and we have the information to predict changes in this system caused by artificial withdrawals. Although the present study was developed to help solve particular problems in a particular environment, it demonstrates the basic techniques that are used and the basic facts that must be collected and interpreted in order to appraise our water resources. Water management is a business, and just like any other business, we must inventory our total assets and balance our expenditures against our receipts. With this knowledge, the development of the water resources may be planned to obtain the fullest measure of benefit for all.